Chapter 941A, Maguses, Might Part 1 How stupid do you think I am? Balkir replied with a sneer. I know you and your kin. Once you are done with me, I'd have no memory about what you promised me, and even if I did, I wouldn't care if you upheld your end of the bargain or even if you asked me to take my children's life. I would only live to please you. You are just like the nobles I hate, if not even worse. I wouldn't be surprised if it was your hand behind what happened to my village. I wish I could take credit for that. Knight laughed with all her heart at the idea. Alas, back then you were nothing but one of the many talented youths of the Garland continent. You were beneath my notice. It was your revenge that made you great. It was your revenge that allowed your genius to bloom and piqued my interest. Now choose and choose wisely because I'm a sadist and I bore easily. Pick the wrong answer and my chosen ones will stay their hands no more. My answer is no. You are no different from the royals who first ignored my pleas for help and then tried to cajole me once they discovered my talent. Scratch that, you're even worse because you threatened my family. Not even the kingdom's assassins ever dared to do that. Balkir's body pulsed with mana as the darkness of the room swirled at his feet like a loyal dog welcoming its master's return. What about this? Night snapped her fingers and the wall behind her throne disappeared, revealing many sobbing, miserable figures chained to the ceiling. Children from all the three great countries from four to ten years of age were forcefully brought by her spirit magic in front of her throne as a meat wall. Tell me, Ilium, did fatherhood made you soft, or are you still the same man I fell head over heels for? Do you dare say no once again now that the lives of so many innocents are in your hands? She asked. What about this as an answer? An enormous amount of darkness magic enveloped Balkir's body. Night had never seen such a spell before, but she could perceive its might. It was enough to end one or two of her chosen, if not even injure her. Do you have nothing to say about it, dear Manohar? Knight said. In my line of work, collateral damage is inevitable. He shrugged. Also, I doubt they would live long, even if Balkir says yes. They were dead the moment you captured them. The god of healing had taken the words out of Balkir's mind. Unbeknownst to Knight, during the eleven years Balkir had pursued his revenge, he had shared through the hive mind connecting his minions all their kills. He had slaughtered everyone on his path, no matter if they were elderly, infants, or even servants to the families of his enemies. Fatherhood didn't make Balkir softer, on the contrary, it made him more feral. He had so much blood on his hands that the children in front of him were but a drop in the ocean. Balkir alone had killed more people than most wars, and the only reason he had stopped was that his body couldn't handle it anymore. Now that his word bounded him to Salark, the only thing that mattered to him was his own family. The rest of Mogur could burn for all he cared. Excellent choice, both of you. Another snap of Knight's fingers made the little bodies wither and die. Their life force was squeezed to the last drop to feed the horsemen and her chosen ones. My children, make those magi scream for me. The Black Knight's sensual smile became twisted into a grimace of savage fury. After spending years courting Balkir, she knew how powerful he was and after her recent skirmish with Minohar, Knight had gauged his strength as well. I wonder how far they can go against my spawns, she thought. Just like Dawn, Knight could create prisms that she could share with her minions. The spawn would bestow upon the undead part of her powers and her mastery over the darkness element, leaving her weakened. Unlike her sister, however, the Link wouldn't grant her any knowledge nor control over their actions. Knight was a spirit of destruction and as such, she would gain the innate abilities of all the undead she shared a symbiotic relationship with, but none of their weaknesses. Berger roared his battle cry and activated the black prism that resided where once was his heart. It made the shadows that comprised his body became so dense that they took physical form. He wielded his battle axe, 
Storm Howl, with two hands and swung it down despite the distance separating him from his mark. The throne hall was 20 meters, 66 feet long, 10 meters, 33 feet wide, and 5 meters high, 16.5 feet. Storm Howl channeled its master's mana, creating a replica of itself made of darkness magic so big that its handle touched the ground while the tip of the battle axe grazed the ceiling for a split second before slamming into Balkir. Darkness magic was supposed to be slow, but thanks to Storm Howl, the spell moved as fast as Berger's hands. The Wraith had never forgiven the God of Death for belittling his liege and had waited for a chance to prove that no human could be a sword better than an undead. Hush, little child. Screaming is just bravado. It will not make you stronger. Balkir pressed his right forefinger against his lips while his eyes turned pitch black due to domination's effect. The conjured axe stopped halfway down as Balkir's mana invaded the focal points of the spell and replaced Barragher's energy signature with his own. The spell shapeshifted so that the tip and the handle of the battle axe switched place. The dark blade was now aimed at the wraith and struck with the might of a collapsing mountain. Barragher had gone all out from the start, making the spell as quick as a bolt of lightning. Not even its caster could dodge it from point-blank range. All the wraith could do was to activate the black prism in his chest to defend against the attack. Darkness magic was the only thing that could stop itself and knight's spawn amplified darkness defensive abilities. Balkir added a bit of his mana to reinforce the spell and used his skill to make it deadlier. The dark axe cut through Berger's shadow arms before stopping against his bones. A human capable of using domination? Knight had suddenly lost her spunk, looking at the scene in disbelief. Even with her great mastery over the darkness element, she was incapable of using domination. No one of her siblings could, and it pained them greatly. What's domination? Berger and Minoher asked in unison, the former in the hope of saving his life while the latter poked bulkier for an answer. I'll tell you when you grow up. The god of death twirled his fingers, switching the tip of the blade with the handle again. The following swing struck in an upward slash that cut the wraith asunder. All of Berger's power was focused into his arms, leaving the rest of his body vulnerable. The wraith and the black prism shattered, both turning into glass fragments before fading out of existence. Chapter 942A, Megas's Might Part 2 a vampire and a lamia conjured their respective best tier 5 darkness spells, Skybreaker and Cruel Sunday Skybreaker unleashed a stream of black lightning bolts, while Cruel Sun generated a sphere of black fire that would grow until it covered the entirety of the room. The former was a fast attack capable of tracking its target, while the latter was slow but its power would kill anyone who wasn't an undead bearing knight's prism. No living being could withstand such heat, and only a spawn could resist so much darkness magic. This time, Balkir had to use life vision to find the focus points of two spells at once. He released a pulse of darkness magic that took control of Skybreaker and Cruel Sun, turning them against their creators. By my mother, are you stupid or what? Knight couldn't afford to lose her chosen ones, so she shielded them with one of her defensive spells. Don't use darkness magic. They are just humans with shitty equipment, whereas you're undead to whom I bestowed upon relics. Use them. Balkir kept manipulating the two spells, sending them to crash against Knight's defenses until all of their mana was exhausted. Minoher, instead, was completely ignoring the battle and focusing solely on his companion. Seriously, how the heck do you do it? Both magi had a violet core and had been gifted with a similar amount of talent, but Balkir had lived for a decade longer. On top of that, being forced to do everything on his own, from preparing the equipment for his valors to open the warp arrays against the Griffin Kingdom, had given the polymath genius plenty of experience in all fields of magic. Minoher was still obsessed with the light element and resorted to the white griffin resources to do what he considered scut work. A doom knight charged forward and suddenly blinked behind Minoher. 
Dimensional magic allowed her to keep her momentum so that between the difference in physical prowess and her heavy armor, she would hit with the strength of a truck. He said to shut up. Can't you see that I'm busy here? The palm of the Avatar of Light erupted from the mad professor's body, stopping the Doom Knight on her tracks and slamming her against a wall. The construct seeped through the openings in her armor as if it was water, and once inside it shape-shifted into buzzsaws that sliced her body until they found the black prism. The Doom Knight died even before her feet could touch the ground again. Enough. Get to safety, my chosen. I'll deal with the humans myself. Knight stood up, snarling in outrage. During his first visit, Minoher didn't manage to kill a single one of my champions, yet now he killed Yuda in a split second. How is this possible? She thought. The answer was that Minoher was known as the Mad Professor, not the stupid one. Against unknown opponents, he would always save his strength in the case the worst happened. All the light magic on Mogur was pointless if he was too dead to use it. Now, however, his obsessive mind demanded answers. Usually looking at a spell once was enough for him to understand its underlying principles, but this time Minoher had no clue how domination worked. Not knowing is the foundation of research, whereas not understanding is the trademark of idiots and I'm no idiot. He thought. However, even the mad professor's thirst for knowledge had to make way for his survival instinct. Unlike Dawn, Knight had never been captured. Her armor wasn't just a spawn shaped for the occasion, but a powerful artifact, just like the spear that appeared between her hands. The black rose and its thorn were items she had crafted using the skills inherited from the best hosts she had inhabited over the centuries. Not only were they masterpieces, but she was also very skilled at using them. Dominate this. Knight lunged at Valkyr without moving from her throne. A pillar of darkness as fast and big as a freight train emerged from Thorn's tip, forcing the god of death to dodge. There were so much mana and willpower stored in that simple attack that domination was useless against it, and so was avoiding it. The pillar performed a sharp turn and chased its target, no forcing bulkier on the defense. Darkness magic imbued with kinetic energy? How the heck is it possible? Even though the pillar kept bolting across the room like a frenzied wasp, Minoher only needed a glance to understand the trick behind it. Spirit magic, you moron. Balkir thought, while dodging the relentless onslaught. He had understood it from Barriger's attack and employed the same principle to kill the wraith. Minoher with his human body couldn't keep up for long, so he used his avatar of light to clash against the pillar and snuff it out. I'm afraid she has a point. Minoher said, That was just a lunge, yet to stop it I needed to spend half of a tier 5 spell's mana. Her equipment is far better than ours. The god of healing had never relied on equipment for two reasons. The first was that he had never needed it to win, and the second was that usually everything the kingdom gifted him with was jam-packed with trackers. He had never felt so helpless before, not even against Thrud. Yet the difference didn't lie in his current opponent's might. The two women were almost matched in power and equipment whereas, against Thrud, Minoher had plenty of allies. He was certain to have overcome the power gap between himself and the Mad Queen by learning silent magic, but reality seemed to differ. Surrender now, swear your loyalty to me, and you will live to replace the Chosen you have killed. Refuse and you'll die. Knight swung her weapon twice, sending a pillar against each of her opponents. The Magi managed to block the attacks, but Minoher's avatar of light shattered for good and bulkier, was pushed several meters back with his arms half-rotten. I might die, but I'm never going to be anyone's puppet. Ask the royals. Minoher snarled while his fingers traced dozens of runes at once. You're wrong as always, knight. Balkir was calm as light fusion healed his wounds and darkness fusion allowed him to ignore the pain. The energy mass he had conjured required surgical precision to be employed. Death is not the end, just the beginning. How can a mortal quote my mother's words? She thought, 
recognizing Baba Yaga's first teaching. Light and darkness were never meant to be used separately. They are part of the whole, and the same applies to all elements. Baba Yaga made a huge mistake by splitting them between you and your siblings. Balkir said, By doing that, she didn't give birth to perfect being, only to perfect failures. You are no different from the fallen races. A mistake that needs fixing. The mass of darkness magic surrounding Balkir exploded, forcing Knight and Minohar to conjure their best shields to protect themselves from the raging storm of mana. Contrary to their expectations, the spell suddenly imploded on Balkir as he took a few mana crystals and aura calcom ingots out of his dimensional amulet. Darkness magic attacked the skinwalker armor he was wearing, along with his feather robe and the other ingredients he had conjured. The spell had never been meant to hurt, only to destroy. It broke the enchanted items down to their molecular structure before revealing the light hidden inside the darkness. Chapter 943 Creation and Chaos Part 1 The light element took all the broken parts and reassembled them into a new form. The entire process only required a split second, and once it was over, Balkir was wearing a full suit of black armor as well. It was the Tier 5 creation magic spell, Phoenix's Forge. The Battle Mage's Elemental God series of spells was nothing but a pale imitation of Salark's original creation. Balkir had witnessed her using Phoenix's Forge while they had fought together against those who had tried to invade the Blood Desert. No matter if Salark faced millennia-old eldritch abominations, monster abomination hybrids, or ageless undead, no matter how hard they struggled, they all had fallen by her hand. Salark was Mogur's Lord of War, the incarnation of light and darkness. Her dominion over the two elements was such that she could use them to alter the nature of things. Darkness would provide her with the raw materials while light would shape them into whatever she could imagine. It allowed her to always have the right equipment at hand, no matter if she was against an old enemy or a completely unknown foe. She could shapeshift and forge master anything in a blink. The only limit of creation magic was that she still needed to know how the enchantments she was creating worked and her creations couldn't exceed the properties of the materials at hand. Salark could extract the strongest metal from the surrounding rocks, but it would still be nothing compared to adamant or davris. It was the reason why the Guardian always brought them with her inside her pocket dimension. Balkir had often wondered why she brought him along if Salark would do almost all the job, and the answer he had come up with was that she was trying to teach him something. The God of Death lacked both her resources and her endless mana, so his creations were powerful, but they never lasted long. To make matters worse, once the spell was over, all the ingredients would be useless since he couldn't use origin flames to at least recycle the metal. The Horsemen of Night couldn't believe what she had just witnessed. Until that day, only two creatures had proven capable of using creation magic. One was Salark, the Lord of War, and the other was Baba Yaga, the mother of all undead. Knight's Black Rose was a full suit plate armor, all the pieces of which were shaped to resemble the petals of a rose in full bloom. Balkir's Phoenix's Forge, instead, had its plates shaped like feathers, the faceplate resembled a beak, and it even had wings coming from its back. It was not by his choice that the armor was shaped as such. Balkir had barely scraped the surface of creation magic and the best he could do was to recreate the spell he was the most familiar with. By the Great Mother, Minohar felt religious for the first time in his life. He had never been so close to death, yet he had never experienced so many sudden bursts of inspiration either. I really need to learn darkness magic, he said, regretting not to have the necessary knowledge to imitate Balkir. Minohar knew about the darkness element solely what he needed to perform his experiments, deeming it an accessory to the light element. Nice piece of crap, Tin Man. Knight sneered. You're still lacking a weapon, though. The thorn was a winged spear with the side tips bent upward and as sharp as the blade itself. 
They were meant to both make each thrust more difficult to dodge and to amplify the spell's night channeled through the weapon. All of her equipment was made of adamant because unlike her brother, Dusk, she wanted to save the best materials for once she found the perfect host. Only then would Knight be able to craft something that would equally fit her and her sword. Knight bolted forward, empowered by both fusion magic and the inhuman reflexes of the awakened undead she possessed. She used the blunt extremity of the spear to strike right between Minoher's eyes, making his head snap back like a whip. He conjured and stacked together several hard light walls to stop the attack, which kept him from being knocked out in a single hit. His shield shattered, but not before taking the brunt of the impact. The Mad Professor crashed behind Knight's enchanted throne and used it to regain his footing. I think I need some good equipment as well. Minoher thought while trying to clear the dizziness clouding his vision. Next time I see him, I'd better take the offer of that urn as guy. Knight didn't stop her movement and charged at Balkir, this time using Thorn's blade. The spear was crackling with the mana its master had stored within. Every one of its movements generated harrowing wails along with a blast of darkness, as if Thorn trapped the mournful souls of its victims. The attack came so fast that only by combining air fusion with a flight spell and air magic to fill his wings did Balkir manage to dodge Knight's lunge by a hair's breadth. Knight smiled at his valiant yet futile effort. Balkir had avoided the physical component of her attack, but Thorn wasn't that simple of a weapon. She turned back by pivoting on the balls of her feet and struck at Balkir, unleashing what looked like a storm of vengeful ghosts. The God of Death had plenty of experience in all fields of magic, but little at fighting opponents of that caliber by himself instead that through his minions. A single wailing wind, one of Thorn's abilities, was enough to open deep cracks in his armor and send him crashing against a wall. Well, what's your diagnosis? Minoher conjured two open palms, one from above and one from below night, that swatted her like a fly and produced a thunderclap on impact. A second set of hands did the same from either side the moment the first pulled away, alternating the clapping motion between them so fast that Knight would never touch the ground again. We're screwed, Balkir said, while watching at the three of them with life vision. Minoher and he had already consumed quite a bit of mana, whereas Knight had still plenty of juice. The spells of her chosen ones were about as strong as my own, yet she blocked them effortlessly. Your spells are not doing her enough damage and the moment night escapes and brings the fight back to close quarter we're dead. What about yours? I have to agree. Any ideas? Minoher said as night pierced his constructs with enough darkness magic to turn them into wisps. Between her black rose armor and the undead body she inhabited, night had suffered little to none damage. Aside from dying, surrendering, or running away. Just one, but it requires that you buy me some time. Since she's handing us our asses already, there's no way that you alone can. Balkir said, Leave it to me. Minoher cut him short and charged at night. All the gold embroidery of his professor uniform turned out to be runes made of light that conjured his most powerful tier 5 spell, supernovas. Knight and Minoher were now surrounded by meteors made of light and fire big enough to form a wall that prevented them from escaping. On top of that, each one of them was powerful enough to blow up a castle. Chapter 944 Creation and Chaos Part 2 Knight would have liked to blink away, but they were in the middle of the encirclement created by supernovas, and it fully covered the dimensional spell's area of effect and then some. You are insane, she said while bracing herself for the impact. She pumped as much mana as she could inside the Black Rose armor and engulfed her body with a thick layer of darkness. Indeed, Minoher replied as the world around them turned into the rough equivalent of the surface of the sun. Meanwhile, on the outside, Balkir was amazed by both Minoher's control over his spell and his foolishness. Not a single speck of light or fire escaped the encirclement, 
leaving the god of death able to fully focus on his own spell. Just like light and darkness were the two sides of the same coin, creation magic had its own counterpart in chaos magic. Salark had forbidden its practice because it was too dangerous, but Balkir had no option left. He cursed his hubris for showing so many skills to Baba Yaga's horsemen. Now that she knew what he was capable of, the Black Knight would never leave him alone until she got what she wanted. If I back down now, I'll live in fear whenever Salark is away for her personal business. I need to show Knight that, by messing with me, she has more to lose than to gain. He thought. Contrary to what many believed, the greatest danger of conjuring chaos magic didn't lie in losing control of its darkness component. When that happened, the caster would simply and quickly die. The use of chaos magic required to completely separate light from darkness, but while darkness would be shoot at the enemy, light would remain. Without its other half, the light element would stimulate the metabolism of its caster to the extreme, turning each second into a year. The few mages who practiced chaos magic would either be eaten by the darkness, consumed by the light, or both. Only abominations could safely use it because their bodies could absorb the light element without a limit. Balkir was just a fake awakened and his life force would have already been extinguished if not for Salark's treatments, he couldn't afford to make a single mistake. While Manohar's spell ravaged the underground complex, causing the room to tremble and dust to fall from the ceiling, Balkir never lost his focus. He split darkness and light in two separate spheres, holding them respectively on his right and left hand. When the blinding light of supernovas faded, Balkir unleashed his Tier 3 Chaos spell, Chaos Eater, the moment he recognized night amid the steam. He was using normal vision with his right eye and life vision with his left. One had been blinded by the mana, while the other by the light, so he could trust neither. Life vision spotted night's darkness magic, but it was eyesight that allowed Balkir to distinguish the friend from the foe. Minohar stood too close to Knight for life vision spotting him. His clothes were tattered and he was bleeding from his eyes, ears, nostrils, and mouth due to the aftereffects of his own spell. How the heck is he still alive? Balkir was flabbergasted. A mage couldn't be hurt by their own mana, but the shockwaves were supposed to have ripped Minohar apart and the steaming air to be so hot that it would burn his lungs. The god of healing was kneeling on the ground with his eyes veiled, but Balkir could see his chest moving rhythmically. To make matters even more unbelievable, Night was faring much worse than the Never Magus. Her black armor had turned white hot from the heat and emitted the characteristic smell of barbecue. Small cracks had appeared on the Black Rose's armbands that Night had used to shield her upper body. For a horseman, the head was just an accessory. Only the living crystal in their chest mattered. How the heck are you still alive? Knight roared, unleashing her attack simultaneously with Balkir's. She had seen an odd shroud of light wrap Minohar's body, but it was so thin that she assumed it was just a desperate last-ditch effort. Even though Minohar had sustained less than one-tenth of the supernova's full power, he was supposed to have died ten times already. Thorn lunged at Minohar's heart as fast as a bullet, but Chaos Magic was faster. Chaos Eater struck her right side, destroying the upper part of the Black Rose along with Knight's right arm and part of her chest. She lost her grip on the Thorn, but even while withstanding such a deadly attack, the expertise Knight had gained through the centuries allowed her attack to reach its target. Minohar conjured all the constructs he had left, but they only managed to slightly deviate the attack. Instead of piercing his heart, Thorn struck his left shoulder, blowing it up as it if was a needle pricking a water balloon. Blood, flesh, and bones splattered everywhere, leaving Minohar with a wound almost as bad as Knight's. The problem was that she was an immortal, whereas he was only human. The mad professor fell on his side, screaming in pain while he tried to stop the bleeding before it was too late. At least now we're even, Meatsack. Knight beckoned and Thorn returned to her left hand. 
You failed, my love. I can wait for another individual as talented as you to be born. It is you who is cornered and alone. Last chance. Her arm was already regenerating and her armor mending. Without a distraction, the second part of Chaos Eater would never connect. Don't count your corpses before they croak, old hag. Do it now. Manohar used his right arm to cling with the full weight of his body on her neck and unleashed a few heat rays through her exposed flesh. He seemed to have overcome the agony and kept casting spells even with only one hand. Balkir felt new respect and amazement for Manohar's stubbornness that edged on insanity and unleashed Chaos Eater again. The white pulse of chaos magic was as fast as its dark counterpart, but its effects couldn't differ more. Chaos Eater absorbed all the darkness element from its victims' bodies to restore the natural balance, causing them to crumble and die. An undead would become stronger with age because the necromantic energies inhabiting their bodies would become more stable as they adapted to their host. A powerful undead was nothing but a powerful mass of darkness, magic with a soul, and a need to feed upon light energy to prolong their existence. The undead fed only to stabilize their blood core, but it was the amount of darkness element it stored that determined how much mana they possessed. Chaos Eater robbed Night's host of its darkness, turning her into a corpse filled with life force that had nowhere to go. The Black Rose cracked everywhere as the lack of balance made the enchantments that comprised it crumble. The armor shattered and Knight's host wrought at a speed visible at the naked eye thanks to the light magic boosting the growth rate of bacteria and fungi. As for Manohar, by the time the white flash disappeared, his body was already that of a person way over 100 years old. His limbs were as thin as twigs, his skin so flabby that it made him unrecognizable, his white hair and beard long enough to touch the ground. Only the mad spark in his eyes was unchanged. Chapter 945 Hostile Takeover Part 1 With her host reduced to a pile of ashes, Knight emitted an ear-piercing wail and then warped away, unable to stand any more the shame of having her crystal form exposed. The black crystal known as the Black Knight reached Baba Yaga's hut, seeking her family's comfort. Unlike Dawn, despite being centuries old, Knight still took defeat with the same grace of a spoiled brat. Balkir was still another, incapable of averting his eyes from the aftermath of Chaos Eater. He could have sworn that Minohar had smiled at him one last time before Knight's scream shattered the god of healing's decrepit body. Age had made it so frail that even a gust of wind would have killed Manohar and Knight's temper tantrum had the fury of a storm. Your insanity was only matched by your bravery, Manohar. I may be the last man standing, but this victory belongs to you. Thank you. Balkir gave the puddle of bones and skin a deep bow with his eyes closed. He didn't pray for Manohar's soul because he knew there were no gods listening. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow people like Knight to exist nor things like what happened to his village to take place. No, thank you. I haven't learned so much since my first day of academy. This was a highly instructive experience. An annoying, familiar voice said. Manohar came out of his hiding place, behind Knight's heavily enchanted throne. When did you? Balkir was flabbergasted, staring at him with eyes wide open. After she hit me in the head, I realized that without a fancy armor, I was cannon fodder. So, I had a construct filled with mana and life force take my place while you two were so busy showing off your mad skills. Thanks for the tip about that life vision thingy, by the way. Manohar cut him short. Man, I swear that this time I'll remember to send a gift basket to Lith. Without his anatomy lessons and his spell, I would never be able to make lifelike constructs like that. It wasn't the first time the mad professor expressed good resolutions toward Lith, but he would usually forget about them the moment he had a brilliant idea, which happened quite often. You dirty son of A. Who's Lith and since when you can add colors to your light projections? Balkir asked. Lith for Hen, uh, a nice guy. You should have heard about him, 
He's got a lot of titles for someone his age, but not so many as us. The magical beasts call him Scourge, while the nobles you hate so much call him the Harbinger of Ruin. After surviving his encounter with the Bright Day, the undead refer to him as the Blackest Knight, whatever that means. As for the colors, since forever. I just never bother adding them because it's useless. Manohar said, I don't care about that crap. If you are alive and well, why that body aging trick? I thought you were dead. Balkir stated his question so that Manohar couldn't avoid it with more ramblings. Well, that was the whole point. Manohar shrugged. You thought I was dead and so did Knight. If she decided to stay and fight, I wouldn't have lasted long. I'm only human, whereas she's immortal and you're kind of awakened. Dying for a mission would have been stupid and I don't deal in stupid. By the way, we better bail before someone comes. I've got two more branches of the undead courts to take down and you need to rest, old man. Manohar said, while pointing at the hole in the ceiling supernovas had opened. The flash had probably been visible for kilometers. You used me, putting my life at risk while you pretended to fight by my side. The next time we meet, I will make sure to return the favor. Balkir laughed at himself. To follow a madman means to be crazier than he is. The god of death thought. The mad professor used light magic to carve. Manohar was here, on all the walls of the throne room to take credit for the kill while Balkir took one of Salark's plumes out of his dimensional item and used its power to go back home. Free country of Lamerth. Beyond the eastern borders of the Gorgon Empire, in the headquarters of the Master. Baitra and Zenagrash were working together in the forge, crafting a fine piece of equipment as a gift for the master. Zenagrash had purified the adamant to its utmost limits. The enhanced metal was now physically and magically ten times stronger than its just-smelted counterpart. They would have liked to use Davris, but the mightiest metal on Mogur was also the hardest to find. Zenagrash took care of the magic circle. Her role was to feed the mystical forge with massive amounts of world energy and keep it stable for all the duration of the process. That way, Vitra could focus solely on her personal forge mastering technique, Spirit Anvil, that had earned her the title of Ruler of the Flames. She would perform the binding of the mana crystals, the runesmithing, and the forge mastering at the same time. It allowed her to freely manipulate all the single parts of the enchantments, from the pseudo-core's shape and size to the mana circulatory system's pattern. Unlike normal forge masters, she would bend the metal to her will, so that the materials she used would fit her spells and not the other way around. It guaranteed her creations to always be perfect and to reach their full potential as she had devised them. It was a technique that even Master Mina Dion admired and that Vitra had brought to the next level after she had stolen Manadian's Fury, the legendary Forge Mastering Hammer. Once they were done, Vitra was holding a full suit of armor as thin as silk and yet capable of withstanding the hit of a guardian. Do you think the Master will like it? Vitra said while the armor shapeshifted into a suit comprised of a white shirt, night blue pants, and jacket. Should be mad not to. Zenagrash shook her head. Damn, I want one, too. My armor is crap compared to this one. When we get our hands on enough adamant and ingredients, sure. Vitra sighed. The purification process enhanced the metal's properties, but it also consumed a lot of raw material. Zenagrash could use origin flames to recycle the adamant of her current equipment, but she would still need nine times more to have enough to craft another piece like that. Why did you make the master an armor? It's us who work in the field and take all risks. Zenagrash asked. How can you say that? The master took us into their home as daughters and risked their life every day to follow the whims of those stupid royals. The master even neglects their research to travel through the great countries and make sure the organization has everything it needs. Baitra said. Yeah, right. A true hero. Zenagrosh grumbled, looking at the Dominator armor in envy. 
She liked the master as well, but a dragon's greed was an always hungry beast. If we're done here, we got work to do. The master has assigned us a mission, remember? Are you sure you want me to come? Vitra said. It would be the first time I go out in the field since I escaped from Laroxia's mines. Chapter 946 Hostile Takeover Part 2 I already get plenty of blood madness fits at home and I'm afraid that under stress things will get much worse. I don't want to screw up your perfect record, Vitra said. All the more reason to bring you along. Blood madness is caused by the trauma that the memories of the other Baitra inflicted upon your mind when you assimilated her essence. You must embrace the good and the bad things of your previous life if you want to heal. Zenagrash said, I'm not that person anymore. It wasn't me killing all those people for petty reasons. I don't want and I have no reason to remember what the original Baitra did. Baitra said, acting childish for a woman her age. You're not? Really? Then, where that hammer and your forge mastering techniques come from? Zenagrosh pointed at Menadian's fury that Baitra was clenching with all her might. Even if you discarded her abomination name, Korg, you are everything that Baitra the Reiji was. You reap the fruits of her work, so you should also accept the consequences of what she did as an emperor beast first and an abomination later. Zenagrosh's voice was calm and held no blame, yet Vaitra started to sob. Do you really think I'm a monster, Zor? Vaitra was the only one besides the master allowed to use Zenagrosh's human name, Zorath. That would be hypocritical of me, BYT. I'm as much of a mass murderer as any other member of the organization. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just saying that you can't only take what's convenient and hide the rest of your memories under the rug. It's not healthy. Please believe me. I speak from experience. Zorath said. They were so close that they used monikers whenever they were alone. It took a while before Baitra managed to calm down and even more to get her to suit up for the occasion. By the gods below, BYT, we're not going to a gala. How can you take this long to get ready? Wear your armor, store your weapons, and we're good to go. After waiting outside Vitra's room for half an hour, Zorath was almost regretting her choice already. Where are we going? Vitra asked, hoping to stall for time. She had been ready for over 25 minutes, but she had yet to find the courage to open the door. We're headed to the city of Palerin, in the Gorgon Empire. The Griffin Kingdom is off-limits because both the Bright Day and the Black Knight have been sighted there. The security is tighter than a corset and there are too many big players in the game. The Blood Desert is off-limits as well, mostly because there is no black market except what Solark allows for. Our treasury is almost empty and we need to fill it to the brim. Our mission is a raid. We are going to rob the local and very rich branch of the Dusk Court Blind, seize their black markets, and their smuggling routes. Operation Hostile Takeover is a go as soon as you get the fuck out. Zorath said, Are we going to say hi to your father? Vitra couldn't delay any longer and walked through the door. Her original nature was that of an emperor beast, so her human form was shaped according to how she imagined herself to be. Vitra looked like a lovely woman in her mid-twenties about 1.75 meters, five feet nine inches, tall, with golden eyes and silver hair. She had a pixie cut that emphasized her oval-shaped face and delicate features. She kept her hair short because she was both a forge master and a blacksmith. Lava didn't go along well with stray hair and washing the smell of sulfur away was hard. Her foundry was located on the mouth of a volcano, the only natural source of heat strong enough to smelt enchanted metals. She was wearing a set of clothes very popular among the Empire's adventurers. It was comprised of a khaki shirt and pants, a dark brown fur-padded leather jacket, and boots with a soft outer sole. Two one-handed war hammers were hung to her belt, and even though they were just for show, they clearly displayed how skillful the hand of the artisan was. Gods above, no. We're going to the Gorgon Empire exactly because my old man is the guardian who cares the less about his own turf. 
He clearly told me that the next time we face will be as enemies, and I'm not going to poke the dragon with a stick without an excellent reason. They alternated opening warp steps to save their strength until they reached the Empire's borders. Between the observation towers and the powerful arrays set in place, it was impossible for a mage to pass unnoticed. Luckily for the monster abomination hybrids, there was a third option. Xenagrash shapeshifted into her shadow dragon form, allowing Vitra to sit comfortably on her back before taking flight. As a dragon, Xenagrash could fly so high that she was outside the observation tower's detection range and the air-blocking arrays didn't bother her. A dragon was too big and heavy to fly without magic, but she could still glide the air currents until she recovered her magical abilities. On top of that, a shadow dragon could alter their weight by turning part of their body into black smoke. There was a reason why Ligain was known as the father of all dragons. Each one of his descendants would be a species of its own, and their bloodline would have unique abilities. Between the dragon's flight speed and dimensional magic, it took them less than one hour to cross the over 2,000 kilometers separating them from the city of Palerin. The Gorgon Empire had a harsher climate than the Griffin Kingdom, and there were plenty of mountain ranges scattered throughout its territory. There was no such thing as middle-sized cities, only small villages and metropolises. The extension of a city was determined solely by the number of cultivable fields in its proximity and how easy it was to get access to the already established commercial routes. Winter and fall were harsh mistresses, so no city could host more people than it could reasonably feed. Relying on the imports was a prerogative reserved only for military bases. Strategic geographical points, where it wasn't possible to build castles, were presided by floating fortresses similar to the Gorgon's empire capital, Manarin. The empire had the most advanced magical development in all the three great countries, but cultivating clouds was still a myth, even for them. Providing the magical fortresses with the resources they needed made it mandatory for every city and village in the empire to pay part of their taxes in gold and the rest in food. It was a unique system that limited the development of urban areas and made fertile land almost more precious than gold. The city of Palerin was an important commercial hub, located near the Dragon Plains, one of the most extensive and fertile areas of cultivated fields in the Gorgon Empire. After the defeat of Visa the Lich, whose armies had conquered the plains during the first days of the invasion, the province was undergoing a quick reorganization. The servants of the Lich had destroyed the food reserves before running away and poisoned the earth, making the empire lose two consecutive harvests. The food had become so scarce that the security of the fields had become one of the top priorities of the local governors. Chapter 9 47 Dreams and Nightmares Part 1 It had taken the mages of the empire a year to cleanse the fields and make the dragon plains suitable for cultivation again. Since most of the territories past Pelerin had been occupied by the undead forces and were under reconstruction as well, they couldn't spare a dime to help with the dragon valley. They were too busy fixing the damages they had sustained during the war to worry about others. It made the valley dependent on Palerin, which had allowed the city to increase its profits by several folds. The local underworld was also experiencing a golden age. Large flows of money meant more opportunities for corruption and increased protection money. Being awarded of a public contract could easily make a merchant into a small noble, so many people were willing to pay to oil the wheels of bureaucracy. Palerin was a model city of the empire. Its cultivated fields were surrounded by great walls made in dark gray stone over 12 meters, 40 feet, high. The cultivated fields were miles away from the city walls, yet they were array protected and heavily guarded no less than Palerin itself. The farmers lived in the external rim to take care of the cattle and the fields at any moment. All of them had been trained in the use of light and earth magic to be able of taking care by themselves of all minor emergencies. Past the city walls, in the outer rim, 
There was the residential area for the mages and the army, so that they could promptly intervene no matter if the enemy attack came from the inside or the outside. Every building was built in solid, enchanted stones and connected to the other districts with their own warp gate. It was the most luxurious and expensive area of the city. Aside from public officials, only the truly rich could afford a house there. The middle rim was the business district, where all the trades took place. Merchant guilds had their offices built in hardwood, while small-time merchants operated in small buildings no bigger than a grocery store. Each block had its warp gate, making the middle rim the place where normal people lived. The inner rim was occupied by the red-light district of the city. It was supposed to be the slums, but unemployment wasn't a thing in the empire. Public health care made everyone as fit as a fiddle, and as long as one was willing to work hard there was plenty to do, even before the war with the undead. The only people who didn't have an honest job were those who didn't look for one. Gambling, prostitution, drug dealers, they all had their base of activities in the slums. As long as people were alive, they would have vices. Instead of wasting time outlawing them, the empire had simply made them part of the system and took taxes even from them. There was a saying in Palerin stating that the tax office was way scarier than the army itself and better funded, too. Despite the inner rim's sordid appearance, the real corruption took place in the middle rim, and it was there that the two abomination hybrids were headed. As all long-lived members of any race— they had an alias in the Empire with a clean record and authentic IDs. Getting inside Palerin was always the easy part. Getting out after committing any kind of crime, however, was another story entirely. Bytra and Zorath had chosen the Prancing Dragon as their base of operations. It was one of the finest establishments in the Middle Rim, ranked higher than the Dragon's Cove and the Dragon Chow. Is it me? Or is everyone obsessed with dragons around these parts? Baitra asked. She didn't come there for less than a decade, yet everything was changed. Even her favorite dish, the Rewill Stew, had been renamed Legane Stew. My old man doesn't make a secret of his existence. Zorath replied. Ever since Milea became the Empress and convinced him to return, the Gorgon Empire basically became the Dragon Empire. Everyone is trying to suck up on him and the upper echelons didn't rename the country only because rewriting all the maps would cost a fortune. I get that, but why? Not even two hours ago, you told me the Guardian doesn't meddle with human activities. Why are they so obsessed with him? Baitra said, Because on the rare occasion he does, Dad performs miracles and asks nothing in return. When the living from the Giera continent and their plague tried to invade the empire, he took care of both single-handedly. When a wheat blight almost caused a famine throughout the empire, he cured it and even restored the affected crops. Sometimes, people get an audience with him and Lore says they all find the answers they had been looking for. Zorath said, Wow, your old man sounds really impressive. Baitra whistled in admiration. Long story short, they suck on him because they are afraid that Legane will leave once the Empress dies or retires. Zorath ignored the compliment. Everyone knows that he only came for Milea and is trying to change his mind about the Empire. The Prancing Dragon was a cozy tavern made of redwood, lighted and heated by magical stones. The huge fireplace served merely to create a relaxed atmosphere, especially during winter. It was furnished with square tables that could host four people tops and with comfortable padded chairs. Waiters moved between the tables, bringing plates and beverages from the kitchen. There was a counter on the east wall with several bar stools and was reserved for the heavy drinkers. Animal furs and depictions of dragons decorated the walls. An unwritten law of the Empire stated that all dragons' reproductions had to depict either a single scale or the full body. Mounting a dragon's head to a wall, no matter if fake, was enough to get the person responsible lynched by an angry mob. So, what are doing here, exactly? Baitra asked after a cute waiter delivered her stew and a pint of red ale along with a wink. I mean, we can kill a few mob bosses, 
but that would only create a power vacuum and turf wars. Sure, it would create an opportunity to empty their vaults ad get away with it, but a big treasure is good only for someone who wants to settle down, whereas we need a constant flow of money. Sometimes I wonder how you survived this long. Zoroth sighed. Of course we're not here to play executioner. People don't submit to you just because you glare at them and we can't remain in Palerin to handle the business. The master already made contact with the locals and set up a parley for us. As I said earlier, we're here to facilitate a hostile takeover. Meaning, Baitra was confused. She prompted a waitress so that her partner would be served as well. Black markets and illegal routes require powerful mages to be established, otherwise it's impossible to avoid the Empire's safety measures. This isn't the Griffin Kingdom. Nobles do not exist, and no title is hereditary. Zoroth said, In the Empire, mages are so highly regarded that crime pays way less than being a civil servant, so bribing one is nigh impossible. Not to mention that the punishment for treason is beyond unspeakable. Hence, since there are no rogue mages, Palerin's underworld relied on the undead courts. After the invasion from Giera and Visa's uprising, however, the Empire is tooth-combing its territories for undead, and even criminals don't trust them. Chapter 948 Dreams and Nightmares Part 2 Wern Yen, a deputy head of the Red Gorgon Cartel, required our help to get rid of his boss, offering us to take the place of the undead. This way, Wern becomes the boss, the cartel takes the guards off its back, and we get a big share of the profits. Everybody wins. Zoroth finally received her meal and decided she would leave no tip for the poor service. Beatrice stew was now barely lukewarm. It's a good plan. Why don't we make Wern arrange our meeting with his boss happen inside the court? The treasure vault should make an excellent advance payment for our services. Baitra asked, My thoughts exactly. The undead aren't going to drop a bone with so much meat attached easily, so I have already planned to strike them first and wipe them out before they can strategize properly. Zoroth said, One more question. Why are your plate and beer mug less filled than mine even though they cost the same? Because you're beautiful and I'm not. Zoroth replied with a shrug. Her serving was actually generous. It was Baitra's that was exaggerated. Zoroth had now the same appearance as when she was still a human awakened. She looked like a woman in her early 30s, about 1.6 meters, 5 feet 3 inches, tall, with black-shaded brown hair and youthful chestnut eyes that contrasted with the ancient wisdom of her gaze. Her skin was naturally so pale that it almost looked sickly and was full of too many freckles to be easy on the eye. She had sharp features, a square jaw, and a nose a tad too long to be considered cute. No way. You're gorgeous. Those words made Baitra yearn to spill the blood of all members of the restaurant staff. Suddenly the torturing techniques stored in her memory didn't seem so scary anymore. I wish. Unlike you, I was born a hybrid. My dad never cared much for appearances when choosing a spouse, only for the versatility of their mind. My mother was a genius, not a stunner, and sadly I took many things from her. I remember that when I was little, I felt part of the family only in my wormling form. Everyone else was so beautiful that it was upsetting, especially when I was a teen. Zenagrosh sighed. What about your mother? Didn't she help you? Baitra asked. No, she was more concerned about her research than about me. Genius, remember? I was raised by my father and many siblings. I asked them the secret about awakening many times, but they always refused to teach me, saying that I wasn't ready, that I would just hurt myself. Zoroth replied. In hindsight, they were right. Back then, the only thing I could think about was body refining and becoming as beautiful as the rest of the family. If they taught me, I would have ended up bursting my mana core when I was too weak to become an abomination and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Long story short, after I finished my growth spurt and most effects of body refining were lost forever, I threw a huge temper tantrum and ran away from home. 
When I came of age, I discarded my draconic half out of spite for my family. I was so conceited that I swore to myself that I wouldn't live a millennium with those looks, thinking that even death was better than such a fate. I spent years studying magic, learning to appreciate Dad's many teachings about mana and world energy, until I self-awakened a few days after my 31st birthday. You'd think that by then I was mature enough to take things slow, yet the moment I noticed that, even if to a lesser degree, body refining still worked, I lost it. I was back being an insecure teen and started to practice accumulation, like there was no tomorrow. I ignored the signs, the pain, everything just to be able to return to the fold and show my father I made it on my own. Then my core cracked, but my mastery of magic and willpower were so strong that instead of dying I was reborn into an abomination. At that point, pride, anger, self-pity, everything was swallowed by the hunger. To add insult to injury, once I evolved into an eldritch, I started to regain the same draconic power I had discarded. Now I look exactly like I did before my death, and I'm too old to give a damn about what other people think. Zoroth had talked while eating while Baitra kept staring at her, while her plate remained untouched. What about you? What's your story and are you going to eat that? Long distance flight always made Zoroth work an appetite. I don't know. I... Suddenly, Baitra's head started to hurt and several images flashed in front of her eyes. She remembered a gentle woman she called Master Mina Dion, a tower with a staircase drenched with blood, and then her hand clenched around Menadian's fury. Baitra tried to connect the dots, but it made her headache worse. She felt so much rage, envy, and shame at the same time that she started to cry. Baitra recognized the early signs of a blood madness fit and panicked. Gaths, no. Please, I don't want to ruin our mission before it even starts. In my frenzy, I might harm Zorath, or even worse, I might draw Ligane's attention. I must. Are you all right? Zorath snapped Baitra out of it by holding her hand. Why are you crying? If you don't want to share your stew, just say it. I'll just order seconds. Baitra was shocked realizing that her fit had lasted barely a few seconds, yet to her, it felt like hours. Even though she was still unable to talk, she was grateful for Zorath kindness in dropping the subject and pretending it was about the food. Two pretty ladies like you shouldn't make each other cry. I'm sure that whatever is going on between you can be solved by good ale and a bit of company. A handsome young man said while pointing at himself and his friend sitting at a nearby table. He was about 1.75 meters, 5 feet 9 inches, tall, with short blonde hair and gray eyes. He also had perfect, white teeth that he was showing off with a stunning smile. Thanks for the offer, but unless you're a waiter and you can bring us seconds, we're not interested. Zenagrosh said with a polite but cold smile. Sometimes. The young man choked on his words when a sudden click announced Zenagrosh's ultimatum. On her right hand, she wore a set of metal dragon claws Baitra had made for her, called Sky Piercer. The silvery glove had six purple magic crystals embedded on its surface, one for each finger and one in the middle of its backhand. Her index, middle, and ring finger were pointed at him. Yet only the claws on her index and ring finger were extended to the length of a sword and touched either side of the youth's neck. Read between the lines, pal. Zenagrosh elongated the last claw as well, just enough to draw the man's attention to her middle finger. I'm sorry I didn't think. Then don't start now. I don't want you getting a headache for doing something you're not used to. Now scram. Her icy glare made it clear that she wasn't going to repeat herself a third time. Chapter 949 Overwhelming Power Part 1 Zenagrosh's charade provided a perfect cover for the two grown men wetting themselves like kids. The truth, however, was that the killing intent came from Baitra, who was still seconds away from a fit of blood madness. She didn't like the stranger intruding in what she considered a private moment one bit. 
The waiters promptly came washing the floor and provided the two women with seconds, serving them simultaneously in the hope to quell their anger. A few hours later, once Vitra had managed to regain her cool, the two abominations went to one of the Red Gorgon Cartel's safe houses to meet their new partner, Wern Yen. Officially, the Red Gorgon was a merchant guild, so the place didn't differ much from a law-abiding enterprise. It was a two-story building made of wood, with a receptionist sitting at a desk in front of the ground floor's entrance, while the rest of the space was taken by offices furnished only with desks, armchairs, and file cabinets. The first floor was similarly furnished, but everything was much more expensive and each room had been made soundproof with magic. The entire building was actually protected by several invisible arrays the value of which was worth more than the entire city block. I'm glad to see that your boss is taking us seriously, Wern said while looking at the two women with approval. He was no mage, but he had a keen sense for recognizing talent in other people. I know that the most talented mages are women, but those two are off the charts. Heck, I feel threatened even though they sit there doing nothing. Their bearing is that of an apex predator. He thought, I'm certain that your magical abilities are great, but are you sure that two of you are enough? We're dealing with undead who are strong enough to kill an adult bear with one hand. How do you plan to survive if they get close? Ren didn't reach his position without planning everything five steps ahead. Before making an enemy out of an undead court, he wanted to be reassured about their odds of success. Ren Yen was a man in his mid-thirties, about 1.68, 5 feet 6 inches, meters tall, with blonde hair and a beard. He had a gentle face, but between his mean eyes and his burly body, he was the kind of person you didn't want to meet alone in a dark alley. He had brought the two abominations in his office, where four bodyguards, each taller and more muscular than Lith, and two of his associates were waiting for them. On paper, Ren was just the manager of the branch they were in, yet his office was beyond luxurious. All the armchairs were silk-lined and crafted with the best materials. Both the carpets and the tapestries hung to the walls were gold-embroidered, showing the masterful hand of the artist. Before discussing such insignificant details, I'd like to make the terms of our agreement clear. Zenagrosh sniffed the air and a disgusted grimace twisted her face as if they were sitting in a shithouse instead of a living room worthy of a marquee. After we dispose of your boss, Tolman, we'll provide the Red Gorgon with the personnel and the means to make your business thrive. In exchange, we'll take 60% of the net profits. What? One of the other men in the room said, 60% is more than what we give to those bloodsuckers. Ren, what point does it have going from a bad to a worse deal? Excellent question, Jellaz. Ren raised his hand to make his fellow deputy head and conspirator shut up. Let's hear our guest's answer before stopping the negotiations. Why should I accept your terms? He interlocked his fingers and leaned back, showing no fear nor weakness. Because if you are the smart man I think you are, you'll understand that numbers are more important than percentages. Zenagrosh said and Ren nodded for her to continue. He had understood what she meant, but he needed the others to hear and understand it on their own, especially his bodyguards. Rebellions aimed high but started low. If the grunts didn't like where the conspiration was going, they would turn traitor in a jiffy. An army only made of generals couldn't win a war. Ren needed loyal soldiers, ready to give up their lives on the spur of the moment so that he could become filthy rich and die of old age. The Red Gorgon works well, but the undead can only support you during the night, whereas my organization will allow you to extend work hours to daytime as well. Zenagrosh said, Double the time, double the profits. Noticing that only one of the deputy heads was smiling, Ren dumbed down the concept. The room turned from gloomy into a ray of sunshine in the blink of an eye. That's just for starters. Zenagrosh continued. Right now, the Empire is breathing down your neck because of Visa and her undead. By getting rid of your current partners, the constables will shift their focus on your competition. 
Not only will you become able to make business more freely, but you could also exploit the enemy's weakness to expand your turf. Two birds with one stone. All those present were eating out of her hand, nodding like parrots. Ren felt threatened by the sudden shift in the power balance in the room. He was now the only one on his side, feeling like a guest inside his own home. I've heard about charisma, but this is too much. If this continues, it will take a minute for the Senegrash to become my boss instead of my partner. Ren thought. Last, but not least, we'll take care of the infiltrators in your ranks. Zenagrosh stood up, moving as quick and silent as a ghost in front of the other deputy head who had spoken earlier and his bodyguard. Tracking is my specialty. I'm even better than a magical beast at following a trail. The problem with you thralls is that no matter how many times you brush your teeth, you can't get rid of the smell of blood. The man turned pale for a split second and then jumped up with so much strength that his chair turned into splinters mixed with stuffing. He had been barely 1.65 meters, 5 feet 5 inches, tall, but now he was standing over 1.82 meters, 6 foot, with his body now covered with bristles ripping through his clothes. The thrall hit Zenagrosh multiple times before anyone could even blink. Each hit produced the noise of a hammer strike and the sound of broken bones. Are you done? She asked a few seconds later, when the repeated impacts had broken his fingers, wrists, and forearms to the point that the creature's arms resembled an accordion. My turn, then. Zenagrosh waved her right hand as if she was shooing a fly. The Sky Piercer cut the thrall at the neck, heart, waist, and knee level while also cauterizing the wounds. It turned him into five pieces without shedding a single drop of blood. The bodyguard, who was actually the thrall's master, snarled and started to shapeshift as well. Korvox were undead capable of moving during the day at the price of a part of their might. Withstanding the sunlight limited their magical abilities but their physical prowess was unaffected. Chapter 950 Overwhelming Power Part 2 Xenagrosh let him complete the metamorphosis so that all those present realized what kind of monsters they had dealt with until that day and that their new partners were even worse. The moment the monster stood over two meters, seven foot tall, spreading a killing intent that added gray streaks to Ren's hair and wrinkles to his eyes, Xenagrosh tapped the Korvok's forehead with her finger. The hollow mist chaos spell that she unleashed spread inside the creature's body and turned it into ashes before he could emit a single wail. All the humans in the room seemed to have aged a decade and even though the Korvok was gone they were still frozen in place. Anything else I should know? Ren bit deep into his lower lip to overcome the terror that had paralyzed his limbs and reaffirm his leadership. No. Everyone else in here is clean. Zenagrosh sniffed each one of those presents, identifying many of their hobbies and vices, but none of them was relevant to the mission at hand. As the new head of the Red Gorgon, I accept your terms. Ren stood up and shook hands with Zenagrosh while the others were still unable to even blink, too afraid that a new horror would unfold the moment darkness clouded their vision. Soon, they would spread the tale of the meeting, turning both Ren the Unflinching and Xenagrosh the Slayer into legendary figures of the underworld. Later, that night, Ren brought Vitra and Xenagrosh with him under the guise of two mercenary mages he had hired. The meeting with Tolman took place in the local branch of the Dusk Court, in front of the undead masters of the Red Gorgon. Ren had sowed discord among the ranks of the cartel, demanding both a change of the terms of the deal with the undead and of leadership. After a failed attempt on his life, Tolman Ironheart had been forced to ask for the help of his patrons. When the rumors about thralls hidden among the cartel spread around, the Red Gorgon belonged to Ren in a matter of hours, leaving Tolman with no allies in Palerin beside the undead. He hoped that they would kill his rival and prefer continuity in the management of the Red Gorgon. Little did he know that the killer had failed on purpose to force the undead to open their doors to the invaders of their own will. If the assassination succeeded, 
Ren would have become the new boss, and the Dust Court wouldn't have given a damn about who was the leader as long as the flow of gold and food didn't stop. That way, instead, he wasn't just plotting against an insignificant human, he was daring to threaten the court, demanding audience from them as if they were peers. That was something the undead couldn't overlook, so they had invited Ren and his followers as their guests, to make an example out of them. Their slow, agonizing death would show the rest of the underworld what happened to a human who didn't play by their rules. Xenagrash admired Ren's guts to enter the tiger's den with no defense but her and Baitra. The two had known just for a few hours, yet the man was already willing to put his life in her hands. I must give it to him. Ren is a scumbag, but he also has an iron will. Besides, who am I to judge? Xenagrash shrugged. It would take him several lifetimes to commit a number of atrocities that could come even close to my own. Why did you request this meeting? The Dusk Court and the Red Gorgon are longtime friends. There's no animosity between us, except that you bring at this table. Lethe, a gorgeous vampire, said. The meeting took place in the court's main hall. It was built to resemble an underground amphitheater that had an oval layout and seating tiers that surrounded the central performance area, like a modern open-air stadium. Ren and the vampire were at the center of the scene, each with only their personal bodyguards on their side. Half of the hall was occupied by the undead and the other by the members of the Red Gorgon. In theory, it was meant to treat them as peers, but the truth was that the Dusk Court wanted to have as many witnesses as they could. A single undead was capable of terrifying dozens of living beings, and without any magical abilities, being exposed to the court's collective bloodlust made the members of the Red Gorgon feel like fish out of water, gasping for air. Friends? What kind of friends put spies inside our very homes? You betrayed our bond of trust first, and now you dare question us? We work while you grow fat and our consciences pay the price for it. You ask for us to provide you with innocent teens, beasts, plant folks, and even children that you feed upon. I say that's enough. Like most of those presents, Ren couldn't care less about innocence as long as he got paid. Yet, they were an excellent subject to rally even the worst crowd and spark what was left of their indignance. Besides, it offered the bunch of criminals a perfect scapegoat to wash their hands of all the blood they spilled. It was like saying, it wasn't your fault. You didn't do it for the money. You did it because the undead forced you to. Lethe was stunned at those words. She looked at the head of the court to signal that something was wrong. Their plan had been to let Ren renegotiate the terms of their deal and then kill him for breaching the etiquette. Even if he acted flawlessly, they could kill him because by attacking Tolman he had betrayed him and in turn the court, as well since he was their representative. It was a paper-thin argument, but it was how the undead court conducted its business for centuries. Yet the human was attacking them directly, demanding to break the deal instead of asking for more favorable conditions. It was akin to a lamb sharpening the tools of a butcher before questioning his mother's honor. Urea the White Lady dismissed Lethe's worries with a sneer. They had searched their guests before letting them in, and she knew most of them very well. Aside from the two strangers, the least of the court's members would easily be able to slaughter them all. Unless one of the girls is Minoher or the Empress, there's nothing to fear. The former is still trapped in the kingdom, while the latter is in the Empire's capital. This Ren must be tired of living. She thought. Then we both agree. The line has been crossed. Lethe said with a wolfish smile. Yet it's you who broke the Pledge of Honor by attacking your master, you who desecrated our hallowed halls with your poisonous words. Your end will be a warning for all those foolish enough to comply with your madness. The vampire moved with such a speed that Wern was able to see her attack, but not to react in time. Lethe expected him to cry or wet himself, but after what Wern had witnessed during that same afternoon, the vampire looked terribly small to his eyes. Xenagrosh intercepted Leth's slender wrist with her left hand, trapping it in a grip stronger than a steel vice.